climate change is the greatest ecological crisis of all times. It's the greatest ecological crisis humanity has ever faced. Um, and <clears throat> what the scientists are telling us with a remarkably united voice um, is that this problem is very, very serious, that we have already put so much greenhouse gas, extra greenhouse gas up into the upper atmosphere that we have pretty much already um, guaranteed ourselves a degree of mild climate change. Um, and what they are telling us with an increasingly loud and desperate voice is that as we continue to do this, we are running a truly unacceptable risk of cataclysmic types of climate change that really nobody even wants to think about what that might look like. Now ordinarily, um, what does a species do unless they, you know, plan to imitate the lemmings? Ordinarily, when you are essentially about, about to commit ecocide, then the sensible response is to sort of take the issue seriously um, and to come to grips with what are we going to have to do to do about this. So that's the second piece of reality, I think, that it's important for us to, to understand. The first piece of reality is climate change is real. Every single time the scientists look at the data, the new data, and evaluate the new data about how rapidly the change is proceeding, every single time the update is, remember what we told you last time? It's even worse. Um, and the other thing to remember about the, you know, what we take to be the consensus from the scientific community, we're taking this information from a very, very large network of scientists and they only tell us what they can get consensus on. So think about what that means. That means that the scientists that are giving us this information are saying this much we can be sure about. Most of them are thinking it's worse than they're telling us. And then every time they tell us and they update us, they tell us, we underestimated just how rapidly this process is going. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing is absolutely nothing's being done about it. Amazing. Are carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions falling any place on the planet? No. You go back to 1992. Um, all the countries of the world came together in Rio de Janeiro at the famous Earth Summit. Some important things were accomplished. Climate change is going to be a real problem. It's being caused by human economic activity, release of greenhouse gases. Um, it's a problem that no country can solve all by itself. Um, it's going to require some form of international cooperation because all countries are going to have to participate in solving this problem. The other really important thing that was decided at Rio de Janeiro was, well, it's important to recognize that when countries participate in, in solving this problem, that you can't expect them all to participate completely equally because Countries have different responsibilities or degrees of responsibility for having created the problem and countries have different capacities for just having the wherewithal and the wealth to actually go about solving the problem. And that was the language that actually goes all the way back to, to uh, the, the Earth Summit um, in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. There was a recognition there and an acceptance on the part of all the attendees at that conference that a solution had to take seriously that countries had different responsibilities for having gone ahead and caused the problem and had different capacities for being able to contribute to a solution. Um, you could roughly say, you know, you could roughly say there was a, con there was a consensus there that we have to solve this problem fairly. So if you, if you want to summarize a lot of complicated sort of resolutions and everything else, it came down to this. The problem's serious. 
going to have to be solved by cooperation amongst countries. It can't be solved individually. Um, and we really we, we need to solve it in a fair way that's reasonably fair. The one thing that they did not decide in, in uh, Rio in 1992, they could not come up with an agreement on mandatory emissions reductions for particular countries. That was a bullet that was too hard to bite in 1992. And so instead what delegations did was they each sort of said, we will volunteer to reduce our emissions by so much. Everybody sort of volunteered, how much am I going to contribute to solving the problem? And various countries made, made announcements there, either in Rio or, in the, in, in, or, or soon after. Well, five years later, the meetings were in Kyoto. And when the world, re when the countries regathered in Kyoto in 1997, um, there, was, there was an overwhelming fact that was staring them in the face. Not a single country had reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Much less had a single country come close to reducing emissions to the degree that they had said voluntarily we are going to try and do such and such. And in Kyoto, they, the world succeeded in biting the hard bullet, the hardest bullet of all, which is to recognize if we don't agree, if we don't have mutual agreement to mandatory reductions, we are not going to solve this problem. Now, economic theory basically suggests that there's every reason to expect this to be the case. You could simply say we don't need, sometimes we don't need economic theory. Somehow the facts and histor history sometimes teaches such an obvious lesson, you don't need to do a lot of theorizing, you just take the lesson from history. Well, you could say what we learned in the five years between Rio and Kyoto was that when we just voluntarily pledge to reduce emissions country by country, it doesn't happen. So we better try something else. Well, economic theory basically bolsters that conclusion. It says it's not an accident that it didn't happen. And perhaps at this juncture, it's really important um, to sort of explain why it is that economic theory says it's no accident that if you try and solve the problem that way you won't get it solved because we are back in that situation again. Ever since Copenhagen there is no international treaty with mandatory reductions for anybody. That process was abandoned in Copenhagen and since Copenhagen the situation is that countries are back to maybe we will have conversations and discussions, um, but basically we are back in the world of countries perhaps hopefully will be making voluntary attempts to reduce carbon emissions. Well, it didn't work before and it isn't going to work now. Um, and what economic theory tells us is that there's every reason to expect that. Um, I think I remember the numbers. I might have to look at a page here. <clears throat> it's basically the free rider problem. And this is a problem that we teach in economic theory courses. And the free rider problem says that if when I do something, I'm not the only one that benefits, a whole bunch of other people benefit too, then I'm going to hesitate to do that if it's also the case that if you did the same thing, you wouldn't be the only one to benefit, I would benefit likewise. So the name comes from this. There's a sort of perverse incentive for neither person or party to go ahead and do what is clearly sort of desirable because there's an incentive for each party to hesitate and wait and let the other person do it and then free ride on what they did because I'm going to benefit from that too. Now, in this context, I can sort of block out the, the, the sort of the rough figures here. China is the most populous country on the earth. When anybody reduces greenhouse, when greenhouse gas emissions are reduced, any place on the earth, roughly speaking, 
every person on the earth benefits equally. That would be exactly true if the negative consequences of climate change were really going to be visited exactly equally on every country. And that's not true. But that's beside, that, that problem is a different, that's a different issue. So for these purposes, just assume for the moment that when greenhouse gas emissions are reduced, no matter where they're reduced, there'll be less climate change, and then we all more or less benefit equally from having less climate change. Well, China is the most populous country on Earth. They have roughly 20% of the world's population. When China reduces greenhouse gas emissions, suppose they do it voluntarily. China is going to do something. They're going to, they're going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Well, they pay 100% of the costs for those reductions. Whatever it costs to reduce their emissions, they pay 100% of the costs. But they only get 20% of the benefits. When the United States reduces, we don't have as many people as China. When the, when the United States reduces greenhouse gas emissions, we pay for 100% of the cost of that, and the United States gets less than 5% of the overall benefits that come from that. Um, when the United Kingdom reduces emissions, they get roughly 1% of the benefit, but they have to pay for 100%. Grenada. What percentage of the benefits does Grenada get if Grenada reduces carbon emissions? 0.0016%. There's no incentive for them to do that, except if they are just going to do everybody a big favor. Well, there's the problem. How does mutually mandatory reductions change the self-calculating logic that, that countries reason, predictably engage in? Well, the Kyoto Treaty said that England would reduce emissions by 5.5%. And basically, they would bear 100% of the cost. But look what they got in exchange. They didn't just get the benefits of their own reduction of 5.5% in emissions. They got the benefits of, the, of a 5.5% reduction in emissions from every other advanced economy in the world. That's what you get if you have mutually agreed to reductions. You get the benefit of all those other countries' reductions along with the benefits of your own. It's a total game changer. It's the only way we're going to solve this problem. So the first thing that has to happen is, and oh, so in Kyoto, they basically said we, nobody's reducing without mandatory, mutually agreed to mandatory reductions. We're going to do it. But they also took seriously, and I, I believe we should take seriously, and I think we can take seriously, the idea that this should be done fairly. And the way they took that into account in Kyoto was they said, look, the advanced economies are responsible for 80% of the excessive emissions that are up there. The underdeveloped countries are really only responsible for at most 20% of what's put in there. So the, the advanced economies really have 80% of the responsibility at this point for having created the problem. And if you take a look at sort of comparative wealth and resources, roughly the same thing is true, that the advanced economies have 80% of the sort of resources that we could reasonably say they should be made available to solve a serious problem. So in Kyoto, they basically did a rough cut. They said, at least temporarily, here in 1997, let's agree that all the advanced economies will commit to mandatory reductions. Not exactly the same for each country. That had to be sort of argued and discussed, but pretty much 5.5%. Five, five and, and we will temporarily exclude the developing economies from committing to mandatory reductions. We'll ask them to please try and reduce, but we'll leave them in the voluntary status. And that was the way in Kyoto that they decided to try and, that, that, was, how they try, that, that was how they decided to implement the notion of fairness and equity. But in Kyoto, it was very, very clear 
that this exclusion for this this sort of temp this exclusion for mandatory reductions for the uh, for the for the less developed countries that this was temporary and that in some post Kyoto treaty then perhaps they would also have to participate in this stronger in this stronger form that's what happened in Kyoto and very soon after Kyoto the U.S. government said we're unwilling to participate. As soon as Bush was elected in 2000, he said, we're withdrawing from the Kyoto process. We don't believe in this. I don't even believe in climate change. That's my official position of my party. Um, this is all nonsense. Um, we're not going to be part of it. And actually, most people thought, well, with the, with the, wealthiest, largest, with the wealthiest country that's the largest polluter out of the process, the whole process is going to really fall apart. And largely thanks to the European countries and largely thanks to the Scandinavian delegations that participated in the, in, in the European Union's sort of thinking and, and thinking and strategizing about this, Kyoto didn't fall apart. Because the Kyoto Treaty said, look, this whole thing will go into effect when enough of the advanced economies sign it. And a lot of thinking was, well, they're not going to get enough sig they're not going to get enough signatures. There's never going to be a Kyoto Treaty, but they did get enough signatures, which was rather surprising. Here, the world is going to engage in mandatory reductions. They're sort of they're really biting the bullet. They're doing this serious thing, and the country that's wealthiest and most responsible is saying, we're just going to free ride. But it happened. And then countries came together in Copenhagen, and some of the countries that came together said, look, we have discovered there's some problems in the Kyoto Treaty between 97 and 209. And these are some serious problems, and we really need to, we need to, we need to fix them. Some of the countries, the European delegations for the most part, absent the UK, the UK was awful. Um, <clears throat> but the European delegations, said, we, we've identified problems in Kyoto. We are here and ready to fix them in a post-Kyoto treaty that retains the incredibly good things that were in that treaty in the first place. The essential good things were we got to have mutually agreed to mandatory reductions, and we got to figure out a way to do this fairly. So we want to retain that and fix the problems. And I'm going to spend some time here in a minute talking about the problems and how they could very easily have been fixed. There were other countries that came to Copenhagen. And, and here, a rather strange thing surprised us all. Um, my wife is an environmental economist. This is actually her chief issue. Um, if any of you have ever heard of the 350 campaign, um, which is a campaign that's very, very active in trying to promote awareness about climate change and sort of urging governments and people to get their governments to do something effective about it. Bill McKibben is the usual spokesperson. Um, my wife's an environmental economist. This is her specialty. She was his chief economic advisor at Copenhagen. And they went, and of course, they came back completely depressed and discouraged over what had happened. And this is something that, uh, that I think is very important for Europeans to think about when, in, in terms of thinking about how you're going to go forward. When the U.S. wasn't even participating, you surprisingly successfully kept on the right track. Now, of course you want the biggest, wealthiest, the biggest polluter in the wealthiest country to join the world's process for solving the problem. And that's what everybody thought maybe hopefully was happening when the Obama administration is newly elected and they say, we are not climate denialists. And verbally, Obama said, and we believe the United States should be playing a very active, even leading role in solving this problem. And Hil I'm sending Hillary off there to Copenhagen and I'm going to fly in two days later. And everybody got all excited about that. But it turned out that what the US delegation, Hillary and Obama said was, we don't like this whole Kyoto thing. Um, we, we really are unwilling to accept mandatory reductions, and we want to work with people who don't want to do mandatory reductions. 
So what came out of Copenhagen was no start on, instead of Copenhagen launching a process that would have, that would have fixed problems in Kyoto and continued to send us farther in the direction of actually seriously doing something about the greatest problem we probably face in this century. Um, we basically went 20 years backwards in time to an international situation that is exactly where the world was prior to 1992, prior to the Earth Summit. We, we literally lost 20 years of international diplomatic process, um, progress in, in, in what happened in Copenhagen. Now, problems with the treaty and ways to fix it. And I'm gonna, I'll be quick, and some of this is a little hard to, to catch, um, but there's plenty, there'll be time to talk about it. There's five things that should have been done and could easily have been done um, to, to make a post-Kyoto treaty. Um, a serious, what are we trying, what do you want in your treaty? You want it to be effective. And effective means is the global reduction in emissions has to be big enough and quick enough so that we actually no longer run an unacceptable risk of triggering cataclysmic climate change. That's what effective means. And effective really is, it's one thing and one thing only. How, have you got a big enough reduction in global emissions? It's nice. It's nice when your goals are very, very clear cut and you can think about them that way and you don't have to get all complicated about it. That's what effective means. Um, we want a treaty that would distribute the burdens of accomplishing this effective prevention of cataclysmic climate fairly. So you want a treaty that's effective, you want a treaty that's fair, and here's where we economists come in, you want a treaty that's efficient. It turns out that there's tremendous differences in what it costs society to reduce emissions in some ways rather than other ways. And there's actually very, very significant differences in what it would cost society to reduce emissions in different countries. So you don't want to reduce emissions where and in ways that it costs the most. You want to reduce emissions where and in ways that cost the least. That's what efficiency is. Now, there's an immediate conflict that arises between what would be a fair, if we want to distribute the emissions reductions fairly, then we would distribute most of those emission reductions predominantly in the more advanced economies and less of the emission reductions in the less developed economies. But unfortunately, it is usually far cheaper to reduce emissions in the poorer economies than in the advanced economies. The basic reason for that is we already have cleaned up industries to some extent. We already drive around in a few sort of uh, hydro cars, smaller cars, where the, the less advanced economies are basically still using that old gas guzzling technology. So <laughs> it's less costly, at least for a while, it's gonna be far less costly for them to reduce emissions than to reduce the same number of tons of emissions in, in advanced economies. Oh, wow, well this is just a problem that is impossible to overcome. You've got a conflict of interest. And it's just too bad it worked out that way. Well, it turns out that there's actually a way of solving that problem, of reconciling. How can we make sure that this problem is solved fairly and at the same time it's solved efficiently, we don't spend more money globally solving this problem than is, than is necessary. Now when I talk to environmental organizations, when I talk to environmental audiences, they quite reasonably have the following attitude. 
you're an economist, so that's why you care about efficiency. I'm an environmentalist. I don't give a damn about efficiency. I care about whether this problem is, fault, is, is going to be solved effectively. And if the person is not only an environmentalist, if they have, you know, a bone of equity in their body, they say, well, and I also would like to see it done, I would also like to see it done uh, fairly. But here's why I tell environmentalists and people who believe in fairness, and I am both of those, that you should care about efficiency. If the reductions are done inefficiently, they're going to cost a lot more. And therefore, the political resistance to reducing the emissions enough so that we actually solve the problem is going to be that much greater. Anything that reduces the costs of achieving a certain level of global emissions is essentially going to make it easier for us to accomplish the incredibly difficult political task of getting people to agree that they are willing to go ahead and do this. So that's why I think even if you're not an economist and you have no particular devotion to the god of efficiency, that from a very practical point of view, that's an important goal. Okay, how could we affix Kyoto? to make it more effective, more fair, and more efficient. Um, first thing is, by the time the delegations uh, arrived in Copenhagen, it was very clear that the overall reduction in emissions, 5.5% for only the advanced countries, wasn't going to get the job done. That wasn't nearly effective. And quite frankly, the European delegations showed up, for the most part, with the attitude we know that the overall cut has to be bigger and steeper. We know it has to be fat. We know we have to do this faster because the science keeps coming in and telling us that the problem is even more serious, unfortunately. So there were delegations that arrived and they were prepared to agree to deeper cuts, deeper, and over, deeper overall cuts. They were willing to listen to the scientists. Um, that needed to happen. Um, unfortunately, the entire process blew up and that never even got discussed. Um, <clears throat> I call that, let the scientist advise us about how much we have to lower the caps, the overall global cap. Um, what's the second thing that has to be done? You have to cap emissions in all countries. You can't exclude, the, ma the mutually agreed to mandatory part is absolutely necessary. Now, that can appear to be problematic. Oh, there's two reasons you want to do that. One is the one that immediately becomes apparent. Well, if we have some countries that are forced to reduce and then other countries that aren't, well, those countries might increase emissions and it just cancels out the ones that we said had to be reduced. So the usual thinking about, well, why should we cap the emissions in all countries is that one, that otherwise the treaty won't be effective. We'll make progress here, and we'll just lose it over here. Um, there's another reason that you want to cap the emissions in all countries. The way, the, the way you reconcile fairness and efficiency in a context where it's more costly to reduce emissions in advanced countries than it is in poor countries, the way you reconcile that is you create and allow, you create a carbon market and you allow carbon trading. If you do that and some countries do not have their emissions capped, you're going to have serious difficulties policing the carbon market. But if you cap emissions in all countries, it turns out that you really don't have to worry about something that will inevitably happen. If you allow carbon trading, there will be cheating. There will be what I call bogus carbon trading. And I'll spell out sort of exactly what it would be so we can talk about it. 
a bogus carbon trade would be a factory in Canada that says we're reducing our emissions, but really isn't. But somehow somebody says you did, and they get more credit for reducing emissions than they really did. Then they sell that credit to some factory in, in Japan. And that factory in Japan doesn't have to reduce its, its emissions because they bought these credits from, from Canada. Oh, but if it's a bogus trade, there really wasn't any reduction in Canada, and now we don't get the reduction we were supposed to get in Japan, this is a serious problem. Now, it would look like it's a serious problem no matter whenever it happens. And, and it's actually very difficult. It turns out that it's a very difficult process to figure out just how much credit should be given to anybody that says I'm reducing my emissions so that they could sell those credits in the market. And it's a difficult problem because you have to compare something that actually happened to something that never did happen. You have to compare a hypothetical outcome to an actual outcome. These people say, okay, we reduced our emissions, but what would have happened if that project hadn't happened? So there's something that the, the, the economists in the field, they call it the baseline problem. Um, and it makes this a difficult process, figuring out exactly how much credits should we give this company for this project saying that they've reduced emissions to some, uh, by this amount. Because they're going to take that credit and they're going to go ahead and sell it to somebody. And as soon as that person that buys it has it, they don't have to reduce emissions by the amount of the, by the, by the, amount of the credits that the piece of paper says. It turns out that if you cap national emissions in all countries, even if bogus, even if bogus credits get sold in the carbon market, it does not reduce the overall reduction in global emissions. This is a complicated issue. It is almost universally misunderstood by many of my political allies in the so-called climate justice movement who have been screaming and yelling about how terrible the carbon market is and the whole Kyoto process and the clean development mechanism is. But there's an easy way to fix the problem. If sources selling emissions operate in countries that have a national cap, and if the treaty forces countries with national caps to actually reach that national reduction, then any time a company in Canada sells a bogus emission to somebody outside, the treaty is going to force somebody else in Canada to actually plug the hole by reducing their emissions. And this has to do... This ultimately, this ultimately goes back to what it's easy to measure and what it's not easy to measure. And there's some surprises in there. What's easy to measure is national emissions. You would think that, God, that has to be hard. That's, that's a huge big thing you're measuring. What were the carbon emissions from a particular country in a particular year? It turns out that is relatively easy. It's so easy that it's almost non-controversial. So there really wouldn't end up being a lot of arguments if the treaty ended up saying to a country, you were supposed to reduce by such and such, but you actually didn't do it because we can measure what you've done. The country would have a very, very difficult time making a credible case that, oh, we really did do it because it's actually rather easy to measure national emissions from data that's already readily available and what the Chinese delegation in Copenhagen didn't understand, we're not talking about you know, on-site inspections to see whether you're doing some sort of nuclear reactor. They got all in a huff in, in, in Copenhagen saying, we're not going to agree to anything you know, where somebody might have to come in and inspect. We don't even have to do it. So it's relatively easy to see when a country has met its mandatory reductions. And the way that the treaty organization is going to decide if the country has met its treaty obligations is they're going to say, what are your actual emissions? How much were you, allow how much were you allowed to emit? 
Did you sell, did anybody in your country sell credits to somebody outside? Because if you sold credits to outside, then you've got to actually have come down as a country by that much more than you actually did. What about if people inside your country bought credits from another country? Well, what that means is we measure your national emissions, we compare it to what was required, but if you bought credits, then you didn't have to come quite down that much. So that's how it would actually work. That's how it sort of did work in the Kyoto process to the extent that any of this was going on during a time period. So the second thing we have to do to sort of fix really a kind of a technical problem in Kyoto is we have to cap the national emissions in every country and we have to basically understand what the treaty organization needs to do is just get about the business of measuring national emissions and checking to see whether or not countries made their target and then actually get about, get about the really serious business of deciding and what are the penalties going to be if a country doesn't. Something that was very under debated and under discussed and under, it was like that was the real sort of elephant in the room that nobody wanted to talk about between 97 and 2009. And that's a serious problem and that doesn't go away. Now, what's the problem with capping national emissions in every country? It's completely unfair to the Republic of the Congo. I take the Republic of the Congo as just one of the more desperately underdeveloped countries in the world. They bear practically no responsibility for carbon emissions. As a matter of fact, their forests sequester a ton of carbon, tons of carbon. And they are dirt poor, trying not to die of AIDS. You're really going to burden them with you know, a cap that says you've got to reduce your carbon emissions? That would reduce your already slim possibility of achieving economic development for your citizens from slim to minus minus number. Well, there's the problem. It's grossly unfair. Ha! Huh. Capping national emissions for every country doesn't mean the same cap. And this is where the single most important document that you can read if you're trying to sort of think through climate change and climate change policy comes up. And neither my wife or I are responsible for it. We are truly, we believe somebody else has done the best work out there on this subject. It's called the Greenhouse Development Rights Framework. The people that put together the Greenhouse Development Rights Framework said this is not rocket science. Differential responsibility, differential capability. The problem with Kyoto was we just did a, a dichotomous split. We said here are a whole bunch, one whole group of countries have responsibility and capability, the other whole group of countries is treated as if they had none. It's really sort of a continuous variable. And we can calculate it. All we need to know is GDP per capita. All we need to know is cumulative emissions per capita. That's data that's sitting there in their wonderful pamphlet. They, it's data. It's available. It's na it gets updated all the time. You can get their pamphlet version of the Greenhouse Development Rights Framework. Um, trying to remember the title of it. Anyway, it's, a, it's, it's referenced in something I think you're going to get sent anyway. Um, but the, easy, the better thing to do is to go to their website online because they keep updating exactly what the differential response. So they calculate an index. They call it a responsibility, a, a responsibility capability index. And it essentially says we can sort of calculate in a way what is the, to, what would be fair to require each country to do in terms of how much they have to bring their emissions down. Well, you can allow the Republic of the Congo to increase its emissions for 20 years as long as it's capped. So you don't even have to require some countries to cut back on their emissions, which would, which would probably make it almost impossible for them to develop at this point. You can allow them to increase emissions as long as the increase is capped. You can say, you have permission to emit more carbon this year in the Republic of the Congo, 10% more than you did last year. You can actually use the, you can allow that. Now, doesn't that mean that some developed country is going to have to reduce even more? Yes, of course it does. So that's the third thing. Let the scientists tell us how much that global cap is going to come down. 
cap emissions in every country so that there's no leakage and you can allow carbon trading and not worry about the fact that maybe somebody sold a bogus carbon credit to somebody else. And, and my climate justice friends, are they're, they're, they're right about one thing. The carbon market is not like other markets. In the apple market, if somebody sold a rotten apple to you and you bought it, you'd object. You'd refuse delivery. You'd say, this is no good. It's rotten. But if somebody, if I buy a certified emissions reduction credit from somebody else, suppose it's totally bogus. They didn't reduce anything. Is there any incentive for me to say, well, this is a rotten certificate? No. All I care about is the certificate is a piece of paper that allows me to reduce my emissions. I just turn it in and my government was going to tell me I had to bring my emissions down by some amount and I can use this piece of paper instead. So I have no incentive as the buyer to care whether or not this apple was rotten. When I hand it to my government, the, in, 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 in my example it was going to be the Japanese company that bought it from the, from the cheating Canadian company. When I hand it to my government, are they going to question me about whether or not there was really a reduction in, China, in, 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 in Canada? No. They have no incentive to because they're just going to take that and hand it over to the treaty organization and say, see, somebody inside Japan bought one of these things. That means Japan doesn't have to reduce as much as a country. And the treaty organization is going to take it and just say, yep, it's certified. So it is true that you have to be, you, you can't assume that the buyer is going to enforce the integrity of the market exchange in carbon markets. So it's very, very important to do two things. Make sure that even when the cheating goes on, that it doesn't reduce, it doesn't puncture holes in our essential goal here, which is to bring down global emissions by a certain amount. And that will, we will protect ourselves against this if the country from which the bogus credit was sold, if it has a cap. Because somebody else in that country then is going to have to make up for that difference. And that's where the unfairness comes in. And it's where the climate justice movement would still play a, play a very important role. There's going to be a lot of cheating. And the cheating's unfair. This is not a victimless crime. But the crime, when you, when you cap the national emissions in every country, the victim, when you have cheating in the carbon market, is not the environment and our goal of protecting the environment and preventing climate change. That's not who's cheated. It's somebody else in the country, inside the country, where the bogus, tr bogus credit was sold out of. So, is there plenty of work for the climate justice movement to do to police the carbon market, to prevent some people inside countries by be, from being cheated by others in their countries selling these credits? Yes, there is. Okay. I'll be quick on this one. Um, actually, early in the game, um, way back in, in, in Rio, people realized it's not emissions that matter, it's net emissions. Whoops, what's that mean? The real problem is adding to the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. That's what the problem's all about. But every year, two things happen. We emit greenhouse gases, and we, mostly nature, sequesters greenhouse gases. So think of it as we send more gas up, but we also take more greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere through sequestration. Does it really matter to us whether we reduce emissions by one ton or we increase sequestration by one ton? Really not. And as a matter of fact, we want to do is both. We want to reduce our emissions and we want to increase our sequestration. And presumably, we want to do which is ever cheapest wherever we can. So what we ought to actually do is put caps on countries' net emissions, not their emissions.
And if we don't do that, we run into a serious problem, and it became very apparent between 97 and 2009. It has to do with deforestation. Forests sequester carbon. You've got a lot of forests here. Now, unfortunately, they are pine needles, and unfortunately, the weather is cold a lot, and unfortunately, it doesn't rain a lot, so you don't sequester as much as they do in the Amazon. But Finland ought to get credit and paid for this. <laughs> so you ought to start demanding it because it's an incredible benefit provided to the rest of the world in terms of you know, preventing climate change. So the problem is it turns out that there is more net emissions from deforestation globally than from the entire world's transportation system. I, I remember when I first saw that, I didn't believe it. When I checked it, I still didn't believe it. It's a real eye-opener. So anybody that thinks, well, you know, we don't want deforestation, but you know, it's a problem that's, that's not immense, think about the entire world's transportation system. That includes all of the automobile emissions. Deforestation is causing more of the increase in net emissions every year than the entire world's transportation industry. And here's the problem. You do not want to encourage the following process. Forest gets burned down for planting agriculture, or forest gets, we deforest, and then we come in, um, and we go ahead and we plant trees and get carbon credits for it. Failing to conserve existing forests and replacing them with new forests is actually going to take us backwards. It's going to be counterproductive in terms of the effect on emissions. Well, you don't want to set up incentives for that. You basically have created programs and incentives for people's behavior so that that's something that turns out to be a really good idea. The simplest way to take care of it is simply to make sure that what you cap and insist on reducing is net emissions from countries. And here again, there's, a, there's an incredible measurement surprise. When I started first working in this field 15, 20 years ago, I went to people that were already doing this in the, in the US, over at the EPA actually. And I said, you know, I, under, I know the science logic that sequestration is you know, important just like emissions are. But I suppose it would be really, really impossible to figure out how much sequestration is going on in different countries. I know that it's not that easy to figure out how much emissions are going on, but I bet it's impossible to figure out just how much carbon is being sequestered in different countries. And they said, au contraire. You wouldn't believe it, but you know those satellites we've got up there? that are floating around, the ones that allow you to go to Google Earth and look in the window of somebody's apartment in Karachi. We know what's going on on every little square foot of the planet all the time. And the botanists have mapped the flora. And the meteorologists tell us what was the temperature and humidity on every day, every place. It's actually the easiest thing to calculate. The easiest and least controversial thing that you would have to calculate to set up a good treaty, enforce a good treaty, actually solve climate change is we can easily figure out how much carbon sequestration is going on in every country every year. So we could cap net emissions and we could measure that and we could then enforce those sort of mutually agreed to mandatory reductions. Um, Equitable caps? Yes. If you do that, if you, cap, net, if you, do, if you <coughs> cap emissions in all countries, if you cap them fairly using some sort of formula like the greenhouse development rights form, framework, um, if you do that, you can allow full carbon trading, which probably in this world today in the emergency situation we face in, despite all the ugly things I told you about markets in that, in that article that some of you read, is probably a necessary component of solving the most drastic problem that humanity faces in a situation where we're not going to be rid of a global market system, you know, within the next two years at least. <clears throat> 
The carbon markets and allowing full carbon trading allows the full efficiency benefits of the trades. You don't have to police the market to worry that bogus trading is going to destroy the effectiveness of the treaty. You can leave the policing basically to national governments and you can rid the climate treaty of that very, very difficult job of deciding how many credits to award to people who want to come in and say, I'm going to do this and I should get credit for this so I can sell it in the carbon market. That's a tough process. Mistakes will be made. Kyoto created a situation where the international carbon, the, the, inter, the, the Kyoto Protocol had to establish a whole international bureaucracy to administer the clean development mechanism. And the clean development mechanism was companies were coming with projects in countries that had no caps saying we're actually reducing emissions and we want to sell this to some company that's going to have to reduce emissions in a, in a, in a country that has a cap. Um, and we needed to basically put together a team of people at the United Nations Clean Development Mechanism that was deciding is this a legitimate reduction and how many credits do you need? It's tough. Mistakes are made. Tremendous amount of arguing and quibbling over this. And the environmental organizations were all over the Clean Development Mechanism. You're making mistakes, you're granting more credits than they really deserve. And of course the businesses are saying, well, you're, you're, you're being so painfully slow in the process that the line is so long that I have to wait three years before I'm evaluated. And then governments would come in and complain, all our companies are sort of waiting in line. This is, hurry up, you gotta do this faster. So it's a very messy process that makes absolutely everybody furious and angry with one another. And it really made it, and, and it became a major obstacle to the climate treaty essentially functioning effectively in a way that was, that was making people confident and happy that this is really going forward. Well, look, if you do these other four things I said, none of which are rocket science, all of which people who went to Copenhagen and environmental organizations and people like my wife understood that these things would be improvements and these things are something that we should, we should be able to agree to. If we did all those things, you could leave the task of awarding credits to national governments. Because it's basically the national governments that have something at stake. If they award a credit that's bogus or they give some company more credit to sell in the carbon market than is legitimate, somebody else inside their country is going to basically pay the price. So essentially, the, 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 you want to make the policeman the one that has the incentive to actually do the best job in a situation where doing the best job is going to be very difficult. So you, and you want to relieve the international organization from the most difficult and troublesome job. So basically, you don't have to have a, the international treaty organization standing in judgment about these credits. What if you have a, a country government that says, well, we just don't want to give any credits to be sold? Because any credits that are sold out of our country, we're going to have to, we know national, that means we're going to have to come down even farther than we would have had to as a country. Fine. If a country government doesn't want to award credits, let them not award credits. If a country government does a terrible job of monitoring and they award many more credits than they should, it will be their own citizens, some other citizens inside their country that are going to pay the price of that. The rest of us are not going to suffer you know, a lowering of the emissions. In any case, I'm going to stop there. Um, actually, I, th I, should say, well, I should say something very provocative about growth in the environment. Let me say that, and that'll open up a whole new area for discussion. Um, yes. In a finite world, infinite growth is impossible. The actual quote is from Kenneth Boulding, and there was a second sentence, and the second sentence is even more delicious. Only a madman or an economist would think otherwise. It is beautiful. But it's just fundamentally wrong. Growth of what? And I'll make the argument very succinct. Ecological economists and 
in some ways I consider myself an ecological economist, have a concept called throughput. It's sort of material matter of various kinds from nature that we use as resources, bring into our production processes, and it's material matter that exits our production processes as waste products. That's what they call throughput. Here is what is true. In a finite planet, infinite growth of throughput is impossible. And only a madman or an economist would think otherwise. But throughput is not GDP. When most economists and most people talk about growth, they're talking about growth of the value of what we produce. And the value of what we produce is not measured in tons, it's measured in dollars or euros. So the real question is this. It is true that if you want to stop treading too heavily on the environment, we need to cut back on throughput. Throughput, steady state throughput, I could be behind that. Um, reducing throughput, well obviously we have to reduce throughput of carbon emissions. If we don't reduce throughput of carbon emissions by 80% by the year 2050, we are going to broil to death. So in some areas we have to dramatically reduce throughput. In some areas we simply have to not increase throughput. But the real question is, is there any reason to believe that it's impossible to reduce throughput or hold throughput steady and yet have the value to us of what we produce in an hour of our time get larger and larger, more or less, forever? I don't think it's impossible at all. What we're really asking, is there, are there any limits on how much more creative and inventive we might be about how much value we get out of our work time? Because that's really, that's what GDP is supposed to represent. Now there's a whole bunch of issues about mismeasurement and everything else. And the other thing I'm going to say on this subject is, <laughs> whenever, Whenever there's massive unemployment, which there is right now, the labor movement is going to say, we need more jobs. And more jobs means we need to get more production going. It's totally understandable. Whenever there's more production, the environmental movement says, but more production just treads more heavily on the environment. And that's only natural. It depends on what you're producing. If we put people back to work, producing the same kind of throughput intensive goods that we have been in the habit of producing. If we put people back to work building more, I call them McMansions. The big housing boom in the United States, a lot of that was these ridiculously huge energy inefficient, you know, mansions being built spread out over, over productive agricultural fields. Well, that is terribly environmentally destructive production. If we produce more by producing more cars and putting a second car in everybody's garage or equipping every Chinese with a car, that is terribly environmentally destructive throughput production. But what if we put people to work producing billions of solar panels and we put people to work installing billions of solar panels on on roofs? What if we put people to work building the windmills in the Columbia River Valley where I live so that we don't have to burn coal for electricity, we're getting more of it from wind power? What if we put people to work retrofitting all our buildings so that their energy efficiency is 80% greater than it is now? We could put hundreds of millions of people to work doing all those things over the next two decades, and as a matter of fact, if we don't, we will broil to death. If we actually set about doing what we need to do, there is no more conflict between growth and the environment. If we produce the kind of things we need to produce to save the environment, there is no conflict between we're going to lose jobs 
that whole thing, I mean, and, and my particular region of the United States, it was the major issue that led to tremendous clashes and disagreements and antagonisms between environmentalists and, and labor organizers. It was called owls versus loggers. So the Environmental Protection Agency said, because of the spotted owl, a species, we're going to stop you know, forestry operations from going on in these particular forests in the coastal range of Oregon. And as a result, there were whole communities where job and unemployment rate went up to 30, 40, 50 percent. They were furious. They didn't have jobs. The environmentalists were happy. They had saved. Nobody really cared about these spotted owls. They're ugly little creatures. Up, oh, I shouldn't say that. Yes, I know there are some people. But the real point was you saved the ecosystems in these incredibly wonderful forests on the coastal range. That was a conflict of interest. But that old debate, that old debate really should not, we should not get entangled in those disagreements anymore. 